I have already earlier mentioned the idea of a collapsed surface. And what I want to do now is to give you more, more information and explanation on the idea of a collapsed surface and how it can be applied in the evaluation of liquefaction. The collapsed surface concept is described in detail in a paper that we ship with the uh, workshop materials. And in the workshop materials, we usually have a folder called Papers of Interest. In this Papers of Interest folder, there is a PDF file, and it's called Liquefaction Assessment. And what I'm going to do here is give a summary of that paper to highlight the key issues, but if you have any involvement with doing a liquefaction assessment, it is absolutely essential that you read this paper to get a full appreciation for the implementation of the collapse surface concept in Quake W. So the behavior of loose sands. Loose sands can have what is called a collapsible grain structure. When the grain structure collapses, the sand can fail and shear at strengths well below the strengths represented, represented by conventional effective strength parameters. And so if we have an, in Q P prime space we have our critical state line. The critical state line represents the point of failure or ultimate strength. The point here is that it is possible to fail at a strength that is well below that represented by C prime and phi prime. Or stated another way, the sand can become mobile at a C and phi much lower than the conventional effective C prime and phi prime. Just a few definitions before we go into the detailed description. Q is the deviatoric stress. It is a representation of the shear in the soil. P prime is the mean effective stress. It is a, a, a relation to the normal stress and this is the mean effective stress, and this is related to the critical state line. The critical state line represents the strength at large strains when the shearing resistance and the volume remain constant with ongoing strain. It is referred to as the steady state strength, or sometimes it is also referred to as the residual strength. There is a subtle difference between the two definitions, but I won't go into that at this time. So in this stress space, we have the mean effective stress is simply sigma one prime, sigma two prime plus sigma three prime divided by three, and that gives us the mean stress. In a triaxial test, the deviatoric stress Q is sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And we can relate the slope, we can relate the slope of the critical state line to, to the effective friction angle phi prime with this relationship here. This is, M is the Greek letter mu. It's not a capital M, it's the Greek letter mu. So as I have introduced earlier, if we were to take a triaxial test on loose sand and we were to start at some isotropically consolidated condition, 
Under monotonic loading, we might follow a stress path something like this, and there would come a point when the sand grain structure would collapse. And so we have a collapse a point. At this stage, what happens depends on the drainage conditions. Usually in a triaxial test, we are under undrained conditions. So at this stage, large pore pressures develop and the strength very suddenly falls down to the steady state strength. Now if we do this in various triaxial tests at different at different starting consolidation pressures, then we get the stress path and we can connect up these collapse points and draw a line through these collapse points and this is what has become known as the collapse surface. The intersection with the critical state line is the steady state strength. Satharian and others at the University of Alberta in 1993 demonstrated that the sand grain structure can collapse during fully drained loading as well as during undrained loading. And what happens after the collapse depends on the drainage conditions. If it, the sand grain structure has collapsed under undrained conditions, then there is a sudden rise in pore water pressure and the soil liquefies. The drainage is impeded. If at that point the drainage, there is a drain condition, then there is a sudden volume change and a decrease in void ratio. But all too often what we ex see and what happens is that when the sand grain structure collapses, we are under un drained conditions and drainage is impeded and when the grain structure collapses we have a sudden rise in pore water pressure, a fall to the undrained steady state strength and all of this in short is a sudden strength loss. There was another research done at the University of Alberta in the 1990s and the point of this research was to determine whether there was such a thing as a collapsible grain structure in dry sand. And this person was indeed able to demonstrate under laboratory conditions and confirm that a collapsible grain structure can exist even in a dry sand. Here is a summary of the test results. There were two different uh, tests, one on very loose and one on loose, and these very careful tests were run in such a way that the effective normal stress was decreased very, very slowly toward the critical state line. But what is of interest is that the very loose material, there came a point before reaching the steady state line where there was a sudden decrease in void ratio, indicating a collapse of the sand grain structure. The loose material exhibited the same trend, but the decrease in void ratio was not as dramatic. But the point of this research is, and the results demonstrate, that the idea of a collapsible grain structure in sand even exists under dry conditions. The beauty of this idea of a collapsed surface is that it gives us a framework to also interpret dynamic loading. In this particular case here, let us assume that we were sitting at this particular Q pre prime location in Q P prime space, and then we begin to apply some cyclic loading. And the cyclic loading produces some excess pore pressures and when the stress path reaches the collapse surface, then once again we have a sudden loss in strength down to the steady state strength. So now we have a framework for interpreting response under both static 
loading and under dynamic loading and within the same framework. In summary, in order for there to be liquefaction and a collapse of the sand grain structure, the stress state must start underneath the clap surface at a point X, for example, and then there must be a stress path, like for example increasing pore water pressures, which takes the mean effective stress towards the collapse surface. So we can already see that the potential for a collapsible grain structure exists when we are underneath here, underneath the clap surface. We can relate the slope of the clap surface to an angle. The angle of the clap surface and so we can relate the slope in Q P prime space to an equivalent friction angle that represents the clap surface itself. Now the inclination of this clap surface is generally related to the density of the material. Here is some information published in this particular paper the uh, details of all the references that I'm referring to here are given at the end of the PowerPoint presentation and are available to you. But basically what this graph is saying that the inclination of the clap surface is related to the density or void ratio. So we have decreasing void ratio meaning a denser material, then the clap surface is at a higher inclination. A very loose material with a higher void ratio then would result in a lower inclination of the clap surface. Here is some more data which I have referred to as the Sladen data. I won't take the time to go into all the details here, but uh, it is described in that white paper that I mentioned that exists in the folder papers of interest. But the significance of this data is that the inclination of the clap surface is somewhere in the range of 14.3 to 18.5 degrees. So now we're beginning to get a handle on the magnitude of the inclination of the clap surface. Here is a summary of an awful lot of data by, by Ladd. Again, a paper that is, uh, the reference is in the, at the end of the PowerPoint presentation. But here again we see that there is the slope, the slope phi of the clap surface is related to the relative density. And at lower relative densities we we tend to have lower inclinations of the clap surface at higher relative densities then of course we have a higher inclination of the clap surface. But interestingly enough out of all of this data the range of the inclination of the clap surface is not all that large and particularly if it is determined that the material is fairly loose or very loose, then we are talking about inclinations of the clap surface somewhere in this range here, say 15 to 20 degrees, or just over 20 degrees. Going back to Stephen Kramer's textbook, he suggests that the inclination of the clap surface is approximately two-thirds of the conventional effective friction angle for clean sands. So we can say that phi L is approximately equal to two-thirds of phi prime for the material. If you are interested in the details in a further discussion, I refer you to Kramer's textbook, 
on page 364. Now the other piece of information we need in order to use this concept of a clap surface is to define the steady state strength. The steady state strengths tend to be very low. In the Beaufort C. Berm failures, it is uh, believed and argued that the undrained steady state strength was very low, somewhere around 2 kPa, which is about a third of a PSF, PSI rather, or under 50 PSF. At the lower San Fernando Dam, which we have already touched on in these discussions, Castro and others have published extensive research findings on the steady state strength of the material at the lower San Fernando Dam, and the general conclusion is that the undrained steady state strength was likely in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 kPa. As it turns out, the steady state strength is less important than the clap surface inclination. And so even a, an estimate of the steady state strength is adequate in most cases. The inclination is way more important in assessing the potential for liquefaction. And so the general trend is it's a very low value and an estimate of a low value is sometimes adequate. The undrained steady state strength, unfortunately, is very sensitive to fines content, and uh, I won't take any time to go into this further here, but you will find this mentioned in the literature, particularly the literature on the Beaufort C. Nerlark Berm papers published by Sladen and others. So we have laboratory evidence of a collapsed surface. There are also many case histories where the concept of a collapsible sand grain structure has provided the basis for a rational explanation of the failures. And I'm going to mention here just a few case histories where this whole idea provided a rational basis for explaining the behavior in each of these case histories. The first one is the Beaufort C. Berms. I refer you to these uh, papers here, published by Sladen in 1985. And this was an artificial island constructed in the Beaufort C. It was uh, constructed by, with dredged material dumped at a particular site to create an island for hydrocarbon exploration. And to make a long story short, there were significant landslide or slope stability type failures under static loading. And the general consensus is that these failed uh, due to liquefaction under static loading. There were one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then finally, the spigot was placed at one location to see if a landslide or a liquefaction failure could be deliberately initiated, and indeed it was. This was the final liquefaction flow slide that was deliberately created by placing material at one particular location. Once again, I refer you to these papers if you're interested in the detail. But the conclusion out of all of this was that the loose sand had a collapsible grain structure and placing additional fill, the static loading, caused the stress path to reach the collapse surface and consequently we had liquefaction flow slides. Here's another case history. This is a hillside mine waste dump there was a waste dump here where the dumping occurred over the edge of the waste dump. And these waste dumps in mining operations due to the dumping process tend to segregate. And it is believed that the segregation resulted in a layer of fines near the base of the dumped 
uh, dump material and that uh, this layer became saturated and additional dumping resulted in additional loading which caused the stress path to move onto the collapsed surface and the fines material liquefied and the waste dump ran down the valley slope for a long distance. Once again, I refer you to this paper. This is a open pit mine in the Canadian Rockies in southern British Columbia. Here's a picture of the extent of the runout and the only rational explanation for this was that a layer had liquefied under static loading and in the that there was such a thing as a collapsible grain structure and when the stress path reached the collapsible surface or the collapsed surface then the material liquefied and caused this flow slide. There's another very important and interesting case history of cold stockpiles. It is now getting to be quite some time ago but in Australia, at a coal exporting terminal, coal was being stockpiled for uh, export and the coal was simply stockpiled by dumping off the end of a conveyor belt. And it was observed that sometimes these coal piles, they would have sudden failures and the slips would flow up to 60 meters after heavy rain and the general consensus is that the failures were initiated under static drained conditions but as Eckerly concluded in his PhD work that the failure was mobilized at a strength lower than the conventional C prime phi prime. In other words he was also inferring the idea of a collapsible grain structure and the mobilization of the material at a reduced strength. We have already made reference to the San Fernando Dam failure where the upstream side of this dam failed very suddenly shortly moments after the San Fernando earthquake and here we see the end result. I once again mention the uh, website of Professor Bollinger at the University of California Davis where this picture came from. Once again it is believed that the hydraulic fill material in this dam reached the point of the collapsed surface. The material sand grain structure collapsed and this is what caused the liquefaction. So, in com some commentary, sufficient laboratory testing results are now available to conclusively demonstrate that loose sands can have a collapsible grain structure. And when the grain structure collapses, failure can occur at a mobilized strength lower than that represented by conventional peak effective strength parameters. And the beauty about this whole idea is that it provides a rational explanation for many observed dramatic failures. That is a brief overview of the concept of a collapsed surface and I will leave the introduction of this idea at this point. Once again, I refer you to the white paper that is in the Papers of Interest folders and you should read that paper if you are going to use Quake W for a liquefaction assessment. The next step is to talk about how the idea of the collapse surface has been implemented in GeoStudio and in Quake W in particular.